if I begin to use my body to please other people or allow other people to use my body for their own pleasure and defile my body in that way, then I am sacrificing what God gave me this body for. It can't be what I was feeling like, no matter what. I just, I got to apologize or I got to accept his apology. It is, boop, we should be back to normal when go in the bedroom and turn it to big stallion. <laughs> Never mind that I still feel really hurt and I don't think you understand why. And I think that this can, this pattern of behavior is going to continue. Never mind the fact that you still resent me and I'm going to feel it in the bedroom. Because you won't look at me because you're just trying to get to the end. You're just trying to get that need met. And it's not about me and you. Because I had this body and the charisma to go with it and was a parentified because I was the child, the oldest child, girl child of a disabled parent. So I had way more responsibility than any child should have over her own life, let alone the life of other loved ones in my home. Mm -hmm. I was convinced that much of the uh, childhood sexual trauma I experienced, obviously specifically from grown men, starting from the age of like five, mm -hmm. uh, it, every single year till I was 18. It was never, and, and beyond 18, but by then I'm grown, so it don't, no longer matters, but it does. Mm -hmm. How do you embrace sexuality after divorce? Why isn't the church talking about sex? Well, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but we're going to talk about that in detail in this segment of It's Scary to Marry. What's up, Brave Arts community? This is Sean Heineman, your premier pre-engagement coach, back with another segment of A Scary to Remarry, inspiring you to love fearlessly. Today, we have a returning guest. She has been, I don't know how many times she's been on the show. She might as well be a co-host at this point, okay? <laughs> Brave Hearts community. Today's guest is a believer, a mom. She's an educator. She's an artist and creator. And she has more than like 130,000 something followers on Instagram. So she has a lot of influence. Brave Hearts community. She's no stranger to the community. Let's show some love to Sabrina. How are you doing this evening, Sabrina? Hey, what's up, family? How you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. You know. Excited about this topic because I read your blog and I'm like, we have to unpack this. And for those who haven't had a chance to read your blog, I'm going to have it linked in the description below so awesome. they can read and comment as well. How do you embrace sexuality after divorce? I want to jump into this. As I was reading, you said when I was married, I thought at my core, I was asexual. What made you believe that? Um, several things. For one, you hear all these stories from the church and from the community and from peers. And, you know, when you get married, you get it on. That's what you do. Like, that's, 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 that's when it's time. It's go time. It's go time. Right. And I got married and there was nothing in my body that felt like it was go time. Um, there were moments, of course, of passion and fun and stuff, but I never genuinely felt, excuse this, horny. I just didn't. There was never a, this physical sensation that people claim they go through where they tossing and turning at night and that was not me. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here like, do I not have sexual urges mm -hmm. and because that was the first time ever I was supposedly able to explore whatever sexual urges and impulses I might have had the fact that I wasn't having them made it feel all the more urgent like this is the freest you could ever be to to be sexual and sensual you are doing it in this undefiled marriage bed but you don't want to it's not even that you're against it. It's not that you hate it. Clearly you do, but you got four kids, okay? <laughs> like, it's happening. 
But it's not happening because of a longing that is happening within you. It is happening because that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so it made me feel like I could live with or with, I could live without sex. Mm -hmm. I, if, if God forbid back then and still today, if that, if my ex-husband were to have died while we were still married in my mind, there would be no urgency. There would be, you know, to remarry, not because of sex. Mm -hmm. Sex was going to be the last thing on my mind because it was the last thing on my mind during my marriage. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, yeah, it was a, it was a moment where I just felt completely disconnected from my body. Uh, my mind did not go certain places sexually, even if I wanted them to, like, even when I tried in earnest, one of his major faults towards me was my lack of pursuit. And that's because I didn't want it. I can't pursue you in that way if I don't want it either. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that was, oh, Jesus, that was a time. Yeah. That was the time. Yeah, because especially in the community of believers, right? You know, the marriage bed is undefiled and, you know, we we talk about those scriptures and stuff. And we think that, <clears throat> you know, the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn, you know, those those classic scriptures. We think, and once we're married, like you said, we're going to, we're going to make it happen. But how how do you, how can you fix that to say if that's someone else that's going through the situation, what would be your solution to this for another couple? Oh, so therapy is huge. And I know that you are a huge advocate of therapy as am I. And I know that. Uh, a lot of people, even in some therapy spaces, especially when you intentionally go after counselors who may have a Christian or religious bent, mm -hmm. sex may still kind of be a taboo topic, even in that sacred space that is therapy. But I do believe that through healing work that does need to happen, first in the mind, first in the mind, and then in the body, I think that that is a huge part of it. It could be as simple as understanding how your past experiences with understanding your body, the knowledge of the body, the knowledge of sexuality and sexuality. What are the things that you have been taught, whether it was in church or through music or through books or from friends or from family? What how what is your mind? What is your the basic mindset you have about sex? What is its purpose? Uh, what is, how does it, how is it supposed to look? Like, how do you imagine it or not imagine it in your mind? Um, and then the next step, I would say, again, you starting with the mental is to go to the physical, really practicing sitting with yourself. I know people talk about like breathing exercises, but that's such a basic and fundamental, but so helpful exercise because when you're listening to your breathing you begin to feel your whole body from the toes on up mm -hmm. you feel your heart beating you feel your blood pumping you feel the sensations of what may be just the, the, the crawling of the skin when you and then you start to put on clothing and you feel certain uh fabrics against your skin some fabrics feel good some fabrics don't and you smell certain smells and some smells make you feel relaxed like a lemongrass or a lavender and some some of them make you feel very refreshed like uh, certain floral smells and some of them make you feel something else that you might not know the words for like amber um and so you get to so you get to that and you listen to what what sounds rain sounds the smell of 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 dew after it rained last night mm -hmm. what smells are interact with your body and what memories do they trigger what feelings do they activate in your body literally I'm, unfortunately in our society we're always just go 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 and we really don't take the time to just sit with ourselves and to feel how our body interacts with the world or even how it feels in and of itself. Mm. I think that because we are told in our teenage years when 
sexuality and like the physical urges begin because we're told in those years to just kind of ignore it or to, you know, that's inappropriate or whatever, mm-hmm. when it's completely appropriate because that's how God made the human body. As soon as I get a period, that means I can get pregnant. If I can get pregnant, my baby, my body gonna want sex in many, in most cases. And so because I spent 10 years pushing those urges away, I never really sat with what is that tingle that I feel? What is that something that 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 itch that I just can't scratch? And what am I supposed to do with it? Mm-hmm. How am I supposed to not get over it, not just rush past it? But how do I sit with that? What is what does that do? How can that create something in me? Whether it's create a passion within a marriage or create art if I'm single or whatever it is, whatever it is, we need to do more getting in tune with our bodies. Mm-hmm. If the statistics are still high <clears throat> for women, including married women mm-hmm. who have never orgasmed, women who have had children who have never had an orgasm. Why? Because they don't even know what it feels like to exist in their own bodies. Mm-hmm. They don't know. We don't even have, we don't even know half the time what it feels like to be full. And that's why we overeat. We keep eating because it tastes good. But if we t- took a moment to stop, and take some deep breaths. Our body will tell you, you're fine. Mm-hmm. You're good. Mm-hmm. You've had enough. And then you can move on to the next thing. But it's all it, it, it's eating has is a culture and it's a lot of these other things. But we've removed it from its true intent, which is a satisfaction of our body's need of survival. And I truly believe that sex in a lot of ways is the same way. We have to understand <clears throat> When I have this urge, whether it's hunger or thirst or a desire for sensuality, Mm -hmm. what does it look like for me to feel that, for me to fully feel it and to know how bad I want it? Because sometimes I'm a little bit hungry. Sometimes I'm a lot hungry. Sometimes I'm a little bit horny. Sometimes I'm a lot hungry. (laughs) What does it look like for me to feel that? What does it take for me to satisfy that? And how do I know when I am done, when I am pleased, when I am full and when I can walk away? Right. Uh, so it's it's a it's a lot of undoing and 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 reintegrating the mind with the body. Mm-hmm. That's good because uh, one of my mentors he told me that great love making you know it starts in the morning. You know, you just priming the pump. You know, the the old it's school. You know. pump. <laughs> so it's it's one of those. He things. ain't lied. He ain't lied. Yeah, right. So you you got to start in the morning, just maybe with a kiss, you know. And everything doesn't have to be physical. Every you know, every touch doesn't have to lead to the bedroom. But you're just taking your time. It's just a gradual progression, you know. It shouldn't. It shouldn't. Our bodies love variety. Our bodies love the almost. It loves the lingering. It loves the not yet. Our minds love it even more. And so absolutely, we should definitely spend more time investing in the not yet than we do in chasing. Even we haven't hit that part yet. That man, I was (laughs) I was done. (laughs) Never man, you yeah, I'm a man of business. What what I'm gonna say is. Okay. Uh, we have to we have to spend more time existing and experiencing the moment. The yes. goal is the journey. The goal is everything in between. Mm-hmm. The goal, the goal, the life, like life, literally shows us this over and over again. That making it to the end is is not the goal. It's all the beautiful stuff that you accomplished in the in the in the meanwhile that made that end goal worthwhile and worthy and beautiful. Otherwise, it's ill-gotten and you will never be satisfied. I'm most satisfied with my meal when I cooked it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's real. Yeah, because we live in this Amazon culture. You know, we just drop everything off at your door real quick to get it next day. I mean, we need everything now. And we look at intimacy and then sex the same way. So sure yeah so why doesn't the church talk about sex or should they is is church the place for that are you a content creator youtuber maybe you've interviewed someone on your video podcast and they said something that was really really good or maybe you said something that was really really good well 
Enter Opus Clips. This is the platform that I use when I wanna share 30 to 60 second video clips that I can share with the whole world. I mean, you can share those clips on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Instagram Reels, like these 30 to 60 second clips that Opus Clips can give to you with the click of a mouse. All you have to do is upload the recording and boom, Opus Clips within maybe 10 minutes will give you 15 to 25 different clips with description on the side of the video. And it also gives you like a title and it gives you a rating and let you know how powerful that clip can be used on social media from a rating of 99 all the way down to maybe 60. This is a phenomenal platform that has took my social media marketing to another level. If you want to level up your social media game, go in the description below right now and get the link for Opus Clips. This will not disappoint you. If it ain't nothing else about a marriage, that's only for the man and the wife. That's that's the one. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's for y'all. Right. Mm -hmm. But you also have people who are believe that that's it can be for other people. Or if it's not people, other things, other toys, other machinery, other whatever. And so with all of this variety, it can be a scary thing to touch. It can be a scary thing to touch because there's so much gray area. There's so much. In most things, there's a right and a wrong, right? Mm -hmm. you, you you either do drink or you don't get drunk, right? You either smoke weed or you don't. You either, you know, pay your tithes or you don't, right? It's a it's a it's a it's a clear line with sex and sexuality. You could be all over the place. And sex is probably the only thing that is reserved for this specific relationship that is not guaranteed to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sexuality is something that almost everyone experiences. And so you're telling me a 50-year-old virgin, what, like, what, how do you speak to that? Mm -hmm. If I speak to it to the married couple, I should be able to speak to it to the 50-year-old virgin too because she, she got urges, she got stuff going on. And so it kind of feels unfair. It feels cumbersome. It's just, it's so sensitive. And so I couldn't completely understand why the church would deal with that. Mm -hmm. However, I think the church has so much to say about everything else. And, and, and that's the unfortunate part of it because much of what the church has to say, they make a law and not guidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Bible say that marriage bed is undefiled. The Bible, the Bible say that his body is mine and my body is his. The Bible say... You know, uh, give some examples in Song of Solomon of how to talk to each other and turn each other on. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. That's about it. Yeah. I don't say too much more about what position you should be in and what you should avoid and how to. Baby, God didn't give Adam and Eve no instructions, but they figured it out. Mm -hmm. They figured it out. Yeah. And so a part of beauty of marriage and in sex inside of marriage is that part of my sexuality and sensuality is a part of that oneness it is best expressed with you and only you it is best created in its highest and most complete form with you and only you and so again i, I would understand why the church would shy away from that but because we have imaginations and we're people and <laughs> in this day and age we get married decades after our bodies start experiencing these things it is actually much to our detriment mm -hmm. that we are not addressing these things in the ways that we should i mean titus 2 is very clear they told them older women to teach them younger women how to love oh, yeah. they hust. Mm -hmm. i don't know what love mean to you mm -hmm. but a part of that for me is help me learn how to drop it low, dip, pick it up slow, turn it all around. Like help me under, or even if you're not teaching me how, give me the space to be vulnerable and talking about the visions and the desires and the and the scenes and the, the imaginations of my heart and help me maneuver through that thing so that I can freely give that to him. Yeah. Because that would have been helpful for me for somebody to say, you're not weird. You're not wrong. Mm -hmm. Your, your dreams and your imaginations are fine. Mm. It is, it is, 
even if it might be connected to some of the trauma that you experienced, the beauty of the marriage that you hope to have is that you can unpack all of that with him. Mm. And if he is a safe man, <clears throat> he will unpack some of his with you too. And y'all will create a newness, a, a, something that you couldn't have imagined. You will create that together. And it will be the most beautiful parts of all that you hoped, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I, nobody told me that. They t- What they told me was, if you're not giving it to him, he's going to get it from somebody else. Mm-hmm. If you're not giving it to him, he's going to be frustrated. He's going to be aggravated. He's going to be overwhelmed. He's not going to be able to do his job well. He's not going to be able to love you well. You you connect with the man through his penis, and he connects with you through heart. What? What? That was not what? Yeah. Buddy. That was unhelpful. Uh, yeah. no. And that's heard no. a lot. I hear a lot of wives hear that kind of, those kind of conversations. When your mom said to you, your body is for you, how did you interpret that at that age? And how do you interpret that now as a grown woman? So when I was seven and my mother said my body is for me, that meant that nobody could touch my body without permission. That meant that it was nobody's business what was going on underneath my clothes or 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 on my clothes. I could wear what I want. I could eat what I want. I could dance how I want. I, I My body is for me. Whatever choices I make with my body, as long as I'm honoring the best versions of myself and, and what myself wants to feel in that moment, mm-hmm. then there's no wrong in that. If I begin to use my body to please other people, or allow other people to use my body for their own pleasure and defile my body in that way, then I am sacrificing what God gave me this body for, at least some part of it. So that's what I understood it to me at seven. I remember, again, I was talking about in the blog how she bought me like thong panties at like seven or eight. Yeah. And my... uh, my, my uh, some of the adults, other adults in my life that were also in community with my mom and me, they were like, why are you doing that? She's too young. Uh, and they like, but if I did it and I didn't tell y'all, you would never know. Why? Because you're not weird. I was looking at her booty all the time. Like, you don't know. You don't know the difference. Mm-hmm. And she doesn't have to, uh, she doesn't have to attach this particular type of underwear with being sexy. It can also be about like avoiding panty lines, which was a thing for girls. I don't know if it's a thing for girls today, young girls today, but back then that was the thing. Okay. <laughs> if it wasn't, if you wasn't wearing some type of concealing underwear, you had that slip on. Okay. Cause you had the, what, what we don't want to see no panty lines. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, But then there was also an element of my mother's training that, wanted me to have some sense of self-value, looking in the mirror and loving what I see. She would have called it sexiness because that was the only vocabulary she really had for it. But what she really meant is, I want you to look in the mirror and at every stage of development, I want you to be enamored with yourself. I want you to, 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 you don't, don't know, can't no boy turn, make you feel good about any bodily insecurities because you don't have them. Because you look at everything and call it beautiful. That is what my mother wanted me to feel about my body. Yeah. And so my body being for me at that age, really, it was prioritized around protection because there were a lot of predators <laughs> around, mm-hmm. um, clearly. You know, yeah. all the stories are coming out now. Um, so, yeah, there were there were lots of those around. But it was also about just self-love. That's good. I, Yeah. And I'm thankful. I'm beyond. That was one of the most powerful things my mother could have given to me was that, 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 that self-love. But now that has meant more bodily autonomy. Self, I, 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 you know, I, I got my, my body changed over time and, you know, there were insecurities that tried to develop. Oh, I don't like my legs. And then I looked at him one day and was like, girl, are you kidding? Oh, I don't like my arms. And I looked at myself one day and was like, (laughs) <laughs> you know, whatever it was, like, yeah. And then, you know, I can separate my struggles with uh childhood sexual abuse and how that impacted my view of self. Like I fully understand how some of those things manifested in my view of self. But again, that self-work, constant self-work has always been a, a, a factor in my life. And so 
even now, is just a constant reclaiming of my body. I'm going to wear what I want to wear. Yeah. And that's just going to be what it is. You're going to get every role. You're going to get, yes. I I have 51 inch hips and a 32 inch waist. That's what it is. Whether I have on sweatpants or booty shorts, mm-hmm. you're going to see it. Mm-hmm. And so nobody can make me feel shame about having it. Nobody can make me feel shame about wanting it nobody can make me feel shame about existing in this body my body is for me baby when I wake up in the morning I ask my body what she want to do today and she tell me when I when I eat something I ask my body are we good and she says no you can have another bite or yeah we can stop here when I feel tight I ask my body what do we need to do Hmm. let's stretch and if my stretch make turns you on baby that's your problem I needed to stretch because that's what my body needed. Like, that was not an invitation for you. My body is for me. It's for me. And even if it is an invitation for you, you know, in the case it would be a husband, it also meant that I've come to learn that even my sensuality and me being turned on is is primarily my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's primarily my responsibility to make sure I orgasm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because that's a big issue in marriages, um, and and that's a that's a whole different that's a whole different show. Uh, it's a whole different show. I'm just saying that <laughs> my body and me feeling the things I want to feel, <clears throat> whatever that may be, mm-hmm. yeah, is my responsibility because it's primarily for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you was talking about sensual. So uh, because you said you were always a sensual uh, being. So give us your definition of sensual. I believe sensuality is just how your body and your mind interact with each other and the world. So. We have five senses, Mm -hmm. sight, taste, touch, smell, hearing. Mm -hmm. We can talk about all the other, you know, random senses, nerve endings, sixth sense, and all that stuff. That's a whole different conversation. Right. But at the very base, we know we got those five. Right. And since all of them are in working order for me, um, some better than others, <laughs> I have to, I have to consider how each of those things impacts the way I perceive the world, how I perceive myself how I experience God and how I experience community, how I experience other people, right? The way I see you is based off the eyeballs I'm looking through. The way, the way that I hear you are based on my ability to hear. If I'm deaf in one ear, then baby, I'm not going to be able to hear half the stuff you're trying to say to me, right? right. Um, and so when I think of sensuality, I have to consider... I, 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 I think of it even more now because I have four children. I get to observe how they interact with the world. I have, a, I have two sons that suck their thumbs. <laughs> my six-year-old, my 10-year-old mm. suck their thumbs incessantly. Yeah. But my six-year-old, when he's sucking his thumb, he has to have something in the same hand that, the, that with the thumb in the mouth. There has to be something soft in his hand that he's also rubbing on at the mm. same time. Mm-hmm. That self-soothing. That happens from the time that they're born. They're learning how to use whatever they have available to them to soothe Mm -hmm. whatever it is that is going on internally that is causing turmoil. Yeah. That's sensuality. Mm -hmm. How is he using his senses to satisfy a basic need of safety, of comfort, Mm -hmm. right? And so (laughs) that changes over time. We can turn to food, taste now. Mm -hmm. Eat when we're emotional, right? Eating is a culture. It can turn to music. What am I listening to 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 either respond to what's going on in, in my mind or to put things in my mind that I desire to be there, right? I might be, just <laughs> last night, I was like feeling defeated and overwhelmed mm-hmm. and I turned on 3-6 Mafia and I started turning up and I just felt confident. Like I feel, I felt good, you know? Yeah. That's, that's what I needed to hear. Those are my, that's a sense. Those are my senses. 
Those are my senses. Never mind the vibrations that are also pumping through the speakers or pumping through the headphones, hitting my body, hitting my heart, hitting my nerve endings and making me feel something that I can't even describe in my gut. Those are senses. And so sensuality involves yeah. all of that. All of that from sucking the pacifier when you're born all the way up until being older and even losing out uh, some of the strength of some of our senses. And, yeah. and how does that impact how we operate with other people? What needs we might have from other people? How we feel about our own capabilities and our view of self? Mm. All of that is sensuality. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Can you break this down for our viewers and listeners? You said, by the time I got married, I was afraid and deeply hurt and severely jaded. Sexual trauma that that I was convinced was self-induced made me feel fear the magic that my body holds. Ooh yeah, that's why I was so like, I, can you talk about that? <laughs> so I have a poem. I have a poem called Love Institute. Mm -hmm. And in that poem... I draw the parallels between prostitution and the young girls like myself who grew up using either their bodies or even their sensibilities, right? Their charisma in order to garner the attention of men, both young and old, for survival. Mm. And so one line in the poem says, I done had this ASS, this behind since I was nine. Mm. Um, from a very young age, I've been a shapely girl. I remember being seven, eight, nine in my aunties and oh, she's starting to fill out. She getting thick. And I'm like, what does that mean? What are you talking about? I'm not getting thick anywhere. Like I'm a child. I'm skinny. What are you like? I'm a dancer. Like what? Are you, but they understood things that I could not yet understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Now that I have daughters, I fully understand <laughs> oh, what yeah. they mean when they said, you know, she's starting to fill out. Mm -hmm. um, and so I struggled for a long, long time with the idea that because I had this body and the charisma to go with it mm -hmm. and was parentified because I was the child, the oldest child, girl child of a disabled parent. So I had way more responsibility than any child should have over her own life, let alone the life of other loved ones in my home. Mm -hmm. I was convinced that much of the uh, childhood sexual trauma I experienced, obviously specifically from grown men, starting from the age of like five, mm -hmm. up every single year till I was 18. There was never, and, and beyond 18, but by then I'm grown, so it don't, no longer matters, but it does. Mm -hmm. The, I, I was convinced that the predatory behavior was in, in part my fault. If I had been more childlike, if I had been in, in mind, in word, in body, never mind the fact that I was a child, right? I got yeah. kids. I was fully a child. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was fully, there's no amount of, there's no amount of paying bills from the age of 12. There's no amount of you know, being mentally aware and advocating for the adults in my life and settling disputes and pulling out wisdom that I didn't realize I had and being the uh, the emotional punching bag of some of the... There's no amount of that in my life that I could have endured before I was 25, really, yeah. that could have justified 26 when I was 15, 32 when I was 18, 25 when I was five, 40 when I was eight. There was no amount of, of that that could have justified those men participating in that kind of behavior with me. Yes. But that didn't change the 15 years where I thought it was my fault. Mm. That didn't change the constant running through my head. What did I wear that made them feel like this was okay? That didn't change the thought in my mind that I'm participating in this because I need school clothes. Mm. So he's getting something he wants and I'm getting something I need. This is consensual. This is what my 15-year-old self is telling me. 
I need school clothes. I need that TI-85 or I'm going to fail pre-calc. I need a ride to school. I need bus fare. I need to feed my mama because she asked me to go ask the deacon for some chips and money for chicken after church. And yeah, he's going to pick me up and put his hand under my skirt. And it's going to feel a little uncomfortable, but I'm young. So he's picking me up like a young girl, but I still don't like how this feels. But my mama sent me to go ask for that money for that chicken because my mama handicapped and I'm cute and I'm charismatic and people like me and people, you know, are going to do what I say faster than they might do what she asks. All of these different things trained me to believe that even if those men were wrong and I knew they were, it was to my benefit. Like I, that's what I signed up for because I was getting something that I needed. And so by the time I am married, my entire sensuality and sexuality is associated with need. It is associated with an exchange, with a transaction. Mm. I am giving you this because you give me this. I'm doing this because you protect and provide. I'm not doing this because... I want you just like you want me because mm. I don't. And I've never wanted anybody in that way. Mm. Right. Mm. Uh, and I'm also afraid because. Splash Waterfalls came out when I was 11. Mm. And Ludacris gave me a very vivid description of what this is supposed to look like. But the church girl in me says that that's wrong. So how do I then, having not watched porn, having not had consensual sex, come into my marriage and start going buck wow? He believed that I ain't learned this from here. When this is the this is who I am, this is who I am, this is who I've been mm -hmm. in my mind. I can't show him that he gonna think something wrong with me. I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I'm scared, and I'm hurt. Because I don't know if I can trust him with this. Because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be this. I'm mm -hmm. supposed to be that. And half the time, I don't even know where this comes from. At that point, right? When I'm 22 and newly married and 23 and 24. Yeah. I don't know where this comes from. I don't know why I'm like this. Is it because of sexual abuse or is it because this is who I am? I don't know. And I don't have time to figure it out because of the emotional in, in in all types of trauma that's happening within the marriage. I just got to keep showing up to the bedroom. Mm. Every argument, I got to show up to the bedroom. Every every terrible thing said about me, every, every all I got to show up to the bedroom. I don't have time to unpack that. I just got to forgive and show up to the bedroom. Mm. When do you have time? There's so much to unpack. Oh, my God. First of all, thank you for uh, the transparency and sharing that. Um, do you believe, was there ever a time in your marriage that you could share that with your ex-husband? No. No. Yeah. no. Mm. I mean, theoretically, maybe. Mm. But again, uh, I was just in a very toxic relationship. And if... We literally told the line between explosive arguments and walking on eggshells. There were very few moments of just, we good. Everything's good. Mm -hmm. if, even if everything else around us is bad, Ian, you are good. I I, I, can, I I can't count. I can barely count how many times that happened. And so you can't unpack stuff like that when everything is a detonator. Yeah. That's, that that could be a detonator. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to argue. I don't have time for that. I got, we got stuff to do. Yeah. We got kids to raise. We have time for that. Yeah. So I'm just showing to the beer room what I got. <laughs> mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of times men think that's the solution to a lot of things when. And women too. You. So w women believe that too? I got an attitude. I just need a little bit of. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <clears throat> and you and I mean you even have and, and my 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 former partner was one of the people. I don't care what we're going through, you better bring that over here. We can go back to being into it afterwards. Mm -hmm. No, I don't want to <laughs> like that doesn't sound like that's how that's 
supposed to go. But I know women who are just like, I can't stand your stinky guts right now. But I got a need that needs to be fulfilled. Get on over here. And again, if that's you, I'm not judging you or saying something is wrong with your body or with your mind. I'm not even calling that toxic necessarily. Like, if y'all refuse to ever deal with y'all issues and just freak y'all way through y'all relationship, now that's toxic. Mm -hmm. That's toxic. Yes. But if you recognize that we're going through something right now and I may not have all the faculties or all the knowledge to be able to express what is what I'm feeling to you, but I, I, I want to and I'm willing to and I'm willing to do the work to make sure that that happens. But in the meantime, in between time, I mean, the Bible tells us that we only supposed to stop doing it for, for fasting and prayer. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like if we fasting from it to gain clarity or to do whatever it is and, and to recommit ourselves and to you know realign whatever it is, whatever reason you decide to fast, if that's what y'all doing, cool, fine, dandy. But I don't think that just being mad at each other is a good enough reason. Like we don't use it as a weapon. I'm mad at you, so I'm not going. Oh, that's not cool, nigga. That's not how that's supposed to go. Yeah. The goal is to speed up we don't want to belabor the tension mm -hmm. we don't want to give satan a, a foothold into our marriage right so sometimes the intimacy of sex might be just the thing the the the, the ability to sit there and just look in each other's eyes long enough we're not cooking, we're not cleaning, we're not talking about a bill, we're not watching a movie, we're not chasing around a child, we're not at work, we're not on, we're not dealing with family issues. It's just me and you in this moment. I'm mm -hmm. with you and nothing else matters. That could be the entryway to the conversation. So, so again, I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't, right? But it can't be, it can't be what I was feeling like, no matter what. I just I gotta apologize or I gotta accept his apology. It is. Boop. We should be back to normal and go in the bedroom and turn it to big stallion. Mm -hmm. Never mind that I still feel really hurt and yeah. I don't think you understand why. And I think that this can, this pattern of behavior is going to continue. Never mind the fact that you still resent me mm -hmm. and I'm going to feel it in the bedroom. Because mm -hmm. you won't look at me because you're just trying to get to the end. Mm. you're just trying to get that need met and it's not about me and you yeah that's a yeah that's a conversation because I, and, and i think that's why it's important to talk about those things you know i don't feel sexual when we're in this this place or i don't feel seen right now or you know that i, sexual, I don't even want to hug you back to sensuality i don't like the sound of your voice mm -hmm. I don't want to smell you. When you in love, when a woman in love, ain't nothing better than that man's natural pheromones. Yeah. But when I can't stand him, baby, I don't want to smell with it. Get away. <laughs> when I'm when I'm feeling seen and, and known and cared for and protected and honored, I want to live in your skin. <laughs> like, are you crazy? It's not about sex. It's about it is truly about being one with you in every way imaginable. I want to wear your hoodies. Uh, I just want, I want to be around you. Yeah. I want you. Yeah. But sure. When things ain't right, that sensuality is broken. Mm -hmm. And it's even worse when, when, it, when it's broken with self and when one or both partners are adding to that. Mm -hmm. Because now my view of self is being damaged because of the way that you view me, the way that you want me to view myself, the way that you treat me, the things that you demand from me that require me to disconnect from the person that I need to be in order to function. That that part of me that my, when my mama told me my body is for me and I decided I wanted to wear leggings and an appropriate tank shirt to the gym and you wanted me to wear sweatpants and and and, then, and still wrap this hoodie around my waist because I'm your girl. I get it. Mm -hmm. I understand. I am your girl. Yeah. I am no less your girl with them niggas on. Because <laughs> <laughs> that, that ring is still on there and I don't see nobody but you. Mm -hmm. 
you're the only man in the world that exists to me. Do you trust that? Do you believe that? Mm -hmm. If you don't believe that, and you're telling me I'm lying to myself because of the choices that I'm making, you're, you're telling me that I'm gaslighting myself, that I'm believing one thing and that I'm choosing actions that don't align with that, which means I am now divorcing what I thought I knew in my mind and my heart about you from my body. But now these two things supposed to come together so that I can pursue you in the bedroom. Mm. Yeah, I I hear you. That's that's real talk. Oh my god. Well, <laughs> on that note, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsors. Transform your life, discover the ultimate solution to weight loss, anti-aging, and an energy an energy boost injections. Our revolutionary formula is designed to help you shed those extra pounds, rejuvenate your skin, and increase your energy levels naturally. I use the these products as well, so I'm not just saying this. So I fully endorse this. Don't wait to feel your best. Start your transformation today and embrace a healthier, more vibrant you. Visit our website, Pure Fit. Now to learn how to join satisfied customers on their journey to a better life, the website is purefit.com. That's P-U-R-E-F-Y-T.com. I'll have that link in the description below. Sabrina, you said, and I know countless women who unfortunately share my story, who found themselves in traditional Christian marriages questioning their sexuality because of trauma. Spiritual trauma from from purity culture. Yeah. I was going to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let's talk about that because, you know, the purity culture movement, you know, that was a big thing to, um, you know, for those of us that's been in the Christian world for a while. But anyway, feel free to uh, expound on that. I don't know who I, um... I don't know who all went to those conferences where they passed around the app or passed around the rose or whatever it is that they passed around. And by the time it got to the end, it was so damaged and disgusting that nobody valued it and wanted it anymore. And somehow we were told to believe that that is us. If we choose to engage in any type of sensuality and sexuality outside of our marriage being, that by the time we got to our husbands, we would be ruined. Simply ruined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so whether it was that or um again the and look i i believe holiness is still right do i believe they were supposed to be wearing them jeans skirts to the ground in 105 degree weather no <laughs> unless they wanted to unless that's what they body told them felt good Right, like right. that. <laughs> but do I believe that's that 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 is a sign of purity and holiness? No, because them boys was them boys was lifting them skirts up Six. in the back. Them skirts look that's easier access than the pants. <laughs> At least with the pants, I got the unzip. I got the babe. All you have to do is lift that skirt. <laughs> like, are you crazy? Absolutely not. Uh, um. Just all of these rules and expectations. I remember there was a season and I was, I fell prey to it. I won't say I fell prey. I, you know, my, some friends and I, we were definitely of the, I don't want to kiss until I marry. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, don't want to kiss until I marry. And I have friends who are still married to this day and have a beautiful, beautiful life together. And I love them. They got married the same year I did. I literally came home from being in their wedding and got engaged the following week. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, they waited until the, the altar to kiss. And I didn't with my ex-husband, but I wanted to. And I communicated to him very, very clearly, multiple times, on multiple months. He was, that was a persistent man, okay? But I told him what I wanted to do. The yeah. fact of the matter is, in my mind, I believed that these things, even when it came to friendships and relationships, remember when I talk about sensuality, yes. it's my my mind's relationship with my body, but it's also my, my mind and my body's relationship with other people. And because purity culture meant that you couldn't be within 10 feet of a man you're not 
people are related to <laughs> because they begin to ask, are you going to be married? Are you going to pursue one another? Why are you so close? Why are you, why are you guys holding hands? Why are you so, why do you guys talk? You can't practice transparency and openness and honesty and accountability and care with your brothers in Christ who are simply your brothers who you may or may not be attracted to, but even, especially if you're not attracted, if you're, especially if you are attracted to them, run. Yeah, right. Stay far away from them because you need to be focused on the Lord. So you never really learn how being around this man makes you feel. Mm. You never really learn how how he smells after he has played basketball in the gym. Makes you feel because you're supposed to be 20 miles away from him. <laughs> okay? Yeah. And you don't know how the sound of his voice in the morning or at night makes you feel. Or when he's stressed makes you feel because yeah. you know what what you shouldn't be on the phone with him before noon and you shouldn't be on the phone with him after five <laughs> like what those are those hours are for the lord <laughs> like, yeah, right. and i know i'm exaggerating right. but there was so many made up rules and this is a this is in tandem right i see a, a lot of people we talk a lot about just the early 90s, I mean, the late 90s and the early 2000s and all of the waves that that were that were happening in youth ministry. This is a direct response to what is happening in the 70s and 80s in the early 90s. You got women's liberation movement, which means abortions and birth control and all the and women are like openly sexual. Mm -hmm. And that just meant wearing certain hairstyles and dressing a certain way. They still wasn't out there, you know, doing whatever. But just because they started believing they should have autonomy over their bodies. And I'm no feminist. I am no feminist. Okay. Yeah. But I do believe that women should have autonomy over their bodies in the way that God prescribes. Sure. And so if I decide that that if I am to never marry, that still does that doesn't mean that I never get to experience my body feeling good. From some type of sensual experience. That doesn't that them them two things don't mean each other. Mm. Like it may mean I never have sex. It may mean that. It probably should mean that. Yeah. But it definitely don't mean I should never feel good in my body in a way that is just overflowing. Like uh that's just ignore all parts of my sensuality and sexuality. So you get that, you get you know, hip hop and the visibility of sensuality because. As an African person who is a part of a religious structure that has been largely constructed spe as specifically as I I knew it growing up yeah. by Westerns, by what by by them, by them people. The ways that our people knew God, and I would argue in many cases, some cases, the God of the Bible was still very sensual, was still very connected mm -hmm. to the body connected to the earth connected and not this stoic brain thing right that you didn't go out and do the work like you no know, we got that we was in there shouting and dancing and and what you might call twerking but like baby did. if it move it move while i shout if it move it move okay <laughs> if it move it move all right like we have always been a very sensual people. And now I am almost divorcing a part of my blackness in order to show up in this Western Christian way that says purity looks like this. That because I have hips that are larger than my waist, I can't wear the same shorts that Sarah wears, even though we're working at the same camp for the same black children, because my body is being sexualized and we're going to continue to perpetuate that sexuality, even within these constructs. Mm. Oh, child, no. Yeah. All of these different made up rules. Yeah. What well, probably came from a well intentioned space. Mm -hmm. We don't, we want to just decrease teen pregnancy, which was on the rise at that time. Yep. We want to decrease uh, instances where girls are experiencing physical sexual violence, which was on the rise at that. We want, they were coming from an earnest place. So I do not sh like make them a villain in right. the story. They were doing what they thought best with the information that they had at that time. Mm -hmm. And some of it, small pieces of it, were wonderful, yeah. were helpful, protected me from a lot, okay? Yeah. But there were also things that 
I I know I am the Sabrina that I am, the person that I am. I remember one time me and my homeboy were sharing a a, a ice cream cone. We were probably 16, 17. We only had a dollar. Mm-hmm. We both wanted ice cream. We went to the ice cream truck and got the ice cream. And the people around us, we were at church, sitting next to each other, eating off the same ice cream, and we are not blood related. Yeah. Why y'all sharing ice cream? Is that your is it, are y'all? De- no, we're poor. Mm-hmm. And we want ice cream. <laughs> you don't have to make it that serious. Do I love him? Yes, that's my brother. Mm-hmm. Um, I would cook for him, I would clean for him, I would be his number one cheerleader and was. Mm-hmm. And have no intentions to marry him and did it mm-hmm. and still wouldn't. <laughs> like, like that just wasn't that wasn't the intention. And even if it was, self-discipline says that I stick around long enough that our friendship outlasts my urges. Yes. So that I can stand before God, stand before you, stand before whoever you are to belong to, and say that that's a good man, Savannah. Mm-hmm. I know it. Because he protected me despite even his own urges. He protected me from himself. Mm. I protected him from myself. We served each other and loved each other and accomplished so much of what God intended for us to accomplish in that, whether it was a, a, a research project in, in high school or missions um, and serving the community and evangelizing, or you know, you get older and you start pouring into your, you in your 20s and 30s, you start connecting with the youth and, you know, teenagers. And me, he and I could have been doing all of this in tandem together mm-hmm. and peacefully parted as he decided to take romance, rom- a romantic closeness and continue on that life mission with who God made for that purpose. Mm-hmm. But instead, he didn't know how to how to how to love a woman and I didn't know how to serve me. Mm. But we weren't allowed to until we was already supposed to be doing it in marriage. Mm. That's crazy. It's crazy. And on top of that, I'm supposed to be sensual and free and freaking on you. Too much. Too much <laughs> at once. Too much. Too much. Too much. Too much. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> you said, uh, so what of my sensuality when I have no husband and don't intend to? What do I do with my sexuality when it is not meant to be shared? What advice do you give to women who were once married, now divorced and single in this place? Ooh, we. <laughs> Whatever choices, mistakes, not mistakes. If you did it on purpose, it ain't a mistake. But <laughs> whatever you've done already, forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Mm. That is a version of you that may or may not be a response to everything that you have been through, everything that you have endured. It may or may not be the real you. You've got time to figure that out. God is patient and will reveal that to you if you just keep on holding on to him. Mm -hmm. Uh, But go back to basics. Start to think think less and less about what you used to do with him mm-hmm. and think about what you used to feel for him. What did it feel like to wear your hair in that, in that one hairstyle that he like? Or to wear that, put on that makeup look that he preferred you not to wear? Mm-hmm. What did it feel like to, to eat pork if he didn't eat pork? <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what? Go, go back and reclaim some of those parts of you that you had to let go of in order to become one and see if that's still who you want to be in your own body. That's the best place to start to be. Everything else, whether you get remarried or not, I think should stem from, not from this. These are the things that I experienced in my, in my previous relationship and want to maintain or want to get rid of or whatever. Nope. I'm a new person because of that person. Maybe I want to keep, hold on to some of the things that make me feel good as a result of that, right? I get to reestablish all of that of my own volition and I don't have to consider nobody else. Mm -hmm. And then, whether I choose to or not, I get to invite people and even potentially a partner to co-labor with me in that. Mm -hmm. 
invite me. I, I can invite people to love me with me. And I want to love you with you. Right. And so, yeah, I really think uh, I really think reestablishing your own separate identity, your own separate sensuality, apart from whatever it is that you built with your partner. Um, that's super important. Yes, that's so good, because when you become this one flesh and then you go through a divorce, you, you do it's painful. find yourself again. Like, who who am I after this? Um, after going through this divorce, because I remember having to ask myself, like, who am I now after going through this divorce of giving up some things to to uh, compromise, right, to make things work for the the the, the marriage opposed to just me? Um, and that's a journey we all have to walk when when you go through that divorce or at least take the time to ask yourself that. Mm -hmm. which I think is very important. Absolutely. Uh, this has been such a phenomenal episode, Sabrina. You, thank you, first of all, for your transparency, because I believe this episode is really going to help some people uh, in so many different ways, from marriage to singleness, and just even loving yourself again, right? To to take that time to love you. So thanks again for your transparency. Let everyone know how they can get in touch with you. Well, uh, you can find me on the internet at she, that's S-H-E, dot unapologetic. I have a website, sheunapologetic.com. I'm on Instagram, she dot unapologetic. You can also follow my YouTube channel. It's not she unapologetic. It is she dot do everything. But if you type in she unapologetic, I might still pop up on YouTube. Who knows? The fact of the matter is you can find me pretty much everywhere at, uh, as she dot unapologetic and yeah yeah i'm thankful to be here tonight yet again <laughs> on this amazing podcast that has oh really challenged me honey because i remember my first time being on here and saying some things and i think my mind has changed even since then i'm not gonna hold you you have put up some some good things that made me go oh maybe huh I'm still not getting married again, but, <laughs> but um, I, I have learned a lot. I have learned a lot. It is still very scary, the thought of remarrying, and therefore I will not be doing it. But the, the work that I have to do, regardless of whether or not I get remarried, you have been, you and your wife have been very instrumental in pushing me in that direction. So I'm thankful and grateful for you and the ministry that this is. Wow. Well, I, I count that as an honor. Um, you just, you just never know who who you're impacting. You're just trying to just, just do life, you know? Um, and, and those clips, any clips that I have posted from you, they just gone crazy uh, especially <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> so. They gonna, they gonna, they gonna, they gonna shoot me for this. Oh, 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 yeah. We got some we got some reels that's that's going to come out. I'm going to have everything linked in the description below. So everyone make sure that you get in touch with Sabrina. She has phenomenal content, uh, as you can tell from this episode. And with this being your fourth time, you I mean, you you just you just might as well be my co-host. I mean, we might as well just. I'm just saying I, I have no problem making this a regular thing. I love talking to you. And I think the the conversations that we have, all the conversations that we have had and the conversations that you continue to have with other guests are so important. I remember going to an event in my church for people in their 20s and 30s. And so much of the content was directed at towards people who have not lived certain parts of life yet, right? They were trying to figure out who they were and what they believe. And I'm like, baby, I don't got to go to this one about smoking weed. I don't smoke it. Don't want to. Don't need to. I've already decided that for myself. Even at 32, I know who I am in that regard. Dealing with, um, you know, who do I want to be with? And do I want to be for the streets? Baby, let me tell you something. I've already been married. I've already had all of the children. Ain't no more children coming. Okay? And so these conversations are, uh, you know, about who I want to be as a young woman and, you know, what my role is and, I don't want to have that. 
I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> like, like, no. Like, I'm trying to figure out how to still accomplish the goal that God set in my soul when I got married, but I'm trying to do it on my own now. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. that's the conversation I want to have. Mm -hmm. How am I going to be a housewife if I ain't got no husband? <laughs> I'm going to go homeschool my kids. Like, how? Help, help me that, in that regard. I don't know. All this other stuff. I, it's wonderful. Yeah. But I'm one of them 30-year-olds who got all that stuff out the way early. I know. So, right. oh, it's a lot. It's not, a, it's not many of us. And then I have another friend. She's 30, her and her husband. And they've been married 10 years. Wow. Like, they they got married. I, I, yeah, they just, they just had their 10-year anniversary in December. So they've been in this thing for a good long while. And they still got a good long while to go, but they definitely ain't newlyweds. <laughs> Two kids, a house, a business in 10 years. Yeah. There's certain arguments they don't have no more, certain secrets they don't keep no more. Mm -hmm. Baby, all that's got long gone. Yeah. And even though they are young, their relationship is in full bloom. Mm -hmm. And so they have things and ideas that my me and my little six years that I had made could never even tap into. And somebody who's the same age as them, but only been married one or two years, well, they just don't get it yet. Yeah. So we have all at so many different places in our lives. And scary to remarry addresses all of that, mm -hmm. addresses all of those in-betweens. And I appreciate you for that. I appreciate you for that. We love it over here. Thank you for sure. I appreciate it. I'm going to have the uh, the blog linked up in the description. And to those who are watching and listening, make sure you subscribe to her blog too as well, because she has phenomenal content. Uh, I'm subscribed as well. So anytime she drop, I get it in the email. So I want you all to do the same thing. It will be in the description as long as as well as with her other content, ways to connect with Sabrina. If you are watching this, make sure you share this in your group chat. I know you got your, your girls and, and your guys, you know, it's five of y'all and then, you know, maybe six of y'all in this, in this group chat. Put this video in your group chat and share it with your friends and then y'all have a conversation about it and leave a comment below. <laughs> if you are listening to this via podcast, make sure you leave a rating and review. By doing so, it leaves you in a drawing for a free Amazon gift card. Who doesn't like free stuff? This is Sean Heineman at Scary to Remarry with special guest Sabrina. And she'll be back again. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, family. <laughs>